my astrophysics journey started in a small town in India when one summer I accidentally stumbled on a book about space in a temple's donation library. Today, I'm a researcher at Caltech, and now I get to study stars whose teaspoon can weigh as much as mountain Everest. Getting here wasn't an easy path. I was a brown girl in a small town who wanted to be free, on her own, wanted to be something that, and do something that she loves and someday maybe become a scientist. Where I come from, these are maniacal thoughts. <laughs> People said, what do you mean? You won't conform. What do you mean? As a girl, you have your own thoughts and your own aspirations. What do you mean you don't want to find a good Indian boy and get married and derive your identity from him? Huh, if you're so smart, why don't you just take up a job as a techie? <sighs> I had no idea where to go and everything around me seemed to scream out all the time because of where I started. It just couldn't be done. So I did what a good Asian kid with an extremely good math score would do. I went to an engineering school with a possibility to do a minor in physics. Once at this school, I hated some of the engineering subjects and rolled my eyes at every boring topic because of the boredom. But once while walking to a dreary lab called Grading Soil Particles, I noticed a flyer on a board and it said, if you're interested in doing an internship in astronomy, please contact Dr. Das. <sighs> right then and there, I took that advert with me, but I was hesitating. The whole night I slept with that advert right next to me, but I didn't contact the person. Maybe I knew once I started this thing, it would mean never going back to what my parents wanted me to be. The next morning, I gathered some courage and dashed off a quick email asking, hi, my name is Amrita. I know nothing about astronomy. Could you please teach me this summer? Swiftly, the person replied. She said, apply for our summer program. And so the wheel started rolling. That summer, I had a fabulous time studying galaxies, how different galaxies have different ages and shapes. Some of them are elongated. Some of them have bars in the middle of them. Some of them are like our Milky Way, spiral with beautiful arms that sweep through the gases and stars. And these arms that sweep around are the ones that put up this fabulous display in front of us as we watch the skies when we see the Milky Way crossing above us. So right then, I had fallen in love and I knew in my gut there was no way I was going back to engineering again. <laughs> but life is not linear. I had to get a job after I finished school. And so I moved to one of the busiest cities on the planet, Mumbai. Every morning, I got it. Got myself into a professional suit, got onto one of the world's most crowded train where people, millions of people are packed like sardines, made my way through a megalith of a steel structure, and every day filled out Excel sheets, shared lunches over drag talks of who got promoted and not. The nights in Mumbai were the longest nights of my life. I squirmed in bed, thinking about everything that I could be and everywhere I could be, but not here. I wanted to be in an intellectual sphere. I craved creativity from inside of me. And one day, I just couldn't take it any longer. That commute, that Excel sheet, that lunch, I just quit. And I had no way to go. At that very point of time, my then boyfriend came to me one day and we had been dating for about four years at that point of time in India. That's about the time we could have been on it. And he told me, hey, so I can't go on with you any longer. And the reason is my mother thinks 
you are too ambitious. I just laughed and hung up on him and told myself, oh, you have a problem with me being ambitious? You have no idea how ambitious I am. And I contacted my old astronomy professor and she connected me to this young professor who had just come back to India from Caltech. And he wanted to conduct his new research in how what happens when two black holes smash into each other. <laughs> I contacted him and got a new job for the next year or so. This was probably the most uncertain, anxious, full of tears and organized time of my life. He was supporting me to do more and more science and to get over all of the patriarchy and inhibitions that I held inside of me. This was nevertheless also the most beautiful time of my life. For once in my life, I wasn't holding myself back, but I was actually holding myself up. And I decided I'm going to take this chance. And I leaped and applied for PhD positions. I was lucky enough to land about six of them and got one which was in Amsterdam. <laughs> Once there, my very punky supervisor at the time asked me, hey, so what do you want to work on? Is it going to be mysterious radio bursts from space or these old dead stars that everyone has been perplexed about since 1960s when an Indian guy called Radhakrishnan proposed a theory of how they are formed? And obviously, I chose the old dead stars. These are the stars born when hefty old stars, at least as massive as our three times that of our sun, get old and pop off in a spectacular supernova explosion. The explosion, what it does is it blows away the outer shell of the stars, the lighter shell of the star. And we are left with like a super dense, intense core, just full of neutrons back together, just like that metro in Mumbai. These stars are the ones I love, and they are called the neutron stars. They have a ginormous magnetic field. Imagine about 100 trillion fridge magnets. So like heaps and heaps of these fridge magnets. And the gravitational pull on these stars is as much as about 2 billion times that of what we experience on our planet Earth. And moreover, these denser stars are formed when you compress the whole of our sun into a small sphere of radius of 10 kilometers. So that's as much as the region of Pasadena. And to top it all off, neutron stars spin faster than the blenders that you see in your kitchen. Normally, when you have a magnet that spins fast in an electric field, some of you might have heard of the Faraday's law, where particles are accelerated and currents start flowing. A neutron star is just like that. It's a massive magnet suspended in space. And what it does is it takes all the free charges around it and accelerates them to these enormous speeds as much as the speed of light. In this process, an intense magnetic, electromagnetic radiation is released from its poles. And this radiation is received. We see it as energetic pulses every time the star crosses our line of sight, just like there is a lighthouse suspended in sky. Today, my job is to find large radio dishes and many space telescopes, including Hubble Space Telescope, the extra telescope such as New Star, which is operated at Caltech. And my, I try to capture and clock these pulses as they arrive. The idea is to Build up a model based on general relativity to understand how the spin behavior of these stars is changing. My quest is to use these models to answer if the old Indian theorist was correct, and how do these stars get to such crazy breathtaking speeds as much as a few hundred times in a second? Okay, that's faster than any of those handling. Specifically, I'm focusing on. This, these kind of stars, the neutron stars, when they have a companion beside them. Because as I had told you before, there is this energetic intense emission coming out of the poles of the star. And as this energetic emission ramps onto the companion, it starts heating it up and makes it fluffier and fluffier, so much so that at one point, 
it can't contain itself within the gravitational field of this of itself and then the neutron star's enormous gravitational pull acts like a vacuum taking in these stripping these stars of the external layers and it forms a disk around it all this material from the companion star and then falls onto the neutron star carrying with it intense angular momentum which acts like a torque and that should theoretically spin it up and this is what i'm focusing on with lots of different telescopes both in space and on our earth to focus on this particular regime of the evolution of neutron stars to really understand is it the boundary conditions of if and where you're born and what were you born with or if it's all the crazy things that happen to you over your lifetime which finally end up deciding where you end up thank you